The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nurmi. At this time, Your Honor, the defense. Yeah, Mr. Nurmi. Thank you, Your Honor. At this point, the defense rests. All right, Mr. Martinez, the state may call its first rebuttal witness. The state calls Janine DeMarta. Please come forward to be sworn. Can you spell your first and last name? J-A-N-E-E-N. -E -E last name is D-E, capital M, A-R-T-E. Raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Please walk around and have a seat. Martinez. May I have your name, please? Janine DeMarty. And uh, what do you do for a living? I'm a clinical psychologist. And uh, as part of being a clinical psychologist, where did you get your undergraduate degree? University of Massachusetts. And when did you get that degree? In 2002. What uh, area did you study to attain that degree? My degree is in psychology. And after that, did you continue your studies? Yes. And did you continue them at that same university or did you go somewhere else? I went to Michigan State University. Uh, and you said that you received your degree what, what year? My undergraduate was in 2002. Right. And you said you went to the University of Michigan. So you went to the University of Michigan what year? I went to Michigan State University in 2003. And in between there, what did you do? I worked in two research labs. And what did you do in those research labs? One research lab was focused on the externalizing behaviors of children. So what I would do in that research lab is conduct psychological evaluations. And how many evaluations would you say you conducted? That's hard to say. Um, I would say roughly 50. They were, I, would, I was administering tests during that time. And so you conducted these evaluations. Did you do anything else? Um, I worked with the data that we received there. I um, worked with the various graduate students, the psychologist that was running the um, research study. I also worked in another research lab where I was the manager of the lab. And then you said that in 2003, I believe, you uh, went to the what, University of Michigan? Or? Michigan State. Michigan State. And uh, what was the purpose of going to Michigan State? I went there to begin school, to begin my doctorate, my PhD. And uh, that course, how long does it take? I completed my master's degree there in 2005, and I completed my doctorate in 2009. So it looks like you were there, what, about five years? Is that correct? I was there five years. And so you completed your studies in 2009, I think you said, correct? I completed my actual studies in 2008. After you complete your studies, you have to complete a residency before you can formally get your doctorate. And this residency, where did that take place? Here in Phoenix, Arizona, at Arizona State Hospital. And how long was that residency? It was a year. And while you are doing this residency work, what is it that you do? 
I worked at Arizona State Hospital. There's um, a number of different branches at Arizona State Hospital. They have what's called the forensic units, where those are where individuals who are deemed guilty except insane, instead of serving their time in prison, they get sent to Arizona State Hospital to get treatment. And with regard to those individuals, what did you do? I provided treatment and evaluation of those patients. When you say treatment, specifically, what are we talking about, since we're going to be talking about evaluations and treatment? What's, what, what is the difference? In treatment, there's different modalities of treatment. Individual treatment would be counseling, sitting across from someone, identifying what their primary areas of concern are, and um, engaging in treatment to try and make them more functioning, alleviate symptoms. And what else did you do there? You treated or counseled people. What else? Mm -hmm. I also performed evaluations. And uh, how many evaluations would you say you performed during that period? I would have to say roughly about 15. And after that year, what did you do in terms of your education or becoming licensed? After that year, I could have become licensed, but I chose not to become licensed at that time. Why is that? I wanted to spend the year um, engaging more with other psychologists who were in practice, so that it's just so that I could get more experience and um, broaden my array of the different domains of type of work that I could do, rather than just going into, for example, becoming um, licensed and then working in a hospital or having my own private practice. I wanted more opportunity to work with various psychologists. So when did you become licensed? I became licensed in July of 2010. And upon becoming or obtaining your license, um, where did you begin working? I became the director of a large behavioral health agency here in Phoenix. As the director of the behavioral health agency, specifically in terms of staff, did you supervise staff? Yes, that was one of my primary roles. So what kind of staff did you supervise? I supervised a broad range of behavioral health staff, including master's level counselors, master's level um, social workers, also doctorate level, both at the MD and PhD level, nurse practitioners. I was essentially in charge of all of the training and all of the clinical work that was done in um, the agency. You indicated that you supervised, I think, doctoral candidates, is that correct? Yes, that's the other thing that I did, is that um, one of my primary responsibilities was to create a training program. It was ended up being quite large, roughly about 30 students. These were master's level and doctoral level students who were in the process of obtaining their degree. So for example, what I taught them how to do was conduct psychological evaluations, interpret test results, write reports, in addition to therapy. So for example, in this case, did you have occasion to go visit the defendant in jail? Yes. And uh, when you went to visit the defendant in jail, did you, somebody come with you? Yes. Who was that? Dr. Celise Corston. She, at the time, she had already obtained her degree, but she was in that situation that I highlighted earlier where she was not, um, she had not received her license yet. So she was shadowing me to learn how to do forensic evaluations. You indicated that you also supervised those that uh, had a master's uh, in this field. Um, specifically, what did you do with regard to them? P individuals who have a master's degree typically do not do evaluations, so I did not train them how to do evaluations. Rather, my primary role with them was to train them how to be clinicians, how to be therapists. Uh, we had somebody by the name of Alice LaViolette who testified here. Um, are you familiar with her? Yes. And uh, in terms of where she falls in this continuum of education, where would she fall? She has her master's degree in counseling, or marriage and family counseling. Is she somebody that you told us that you supervise these individuals? Would she be somebody that you also supervised in your previous position? Yes. And um, so you have the, those that have the doctorate uh, and, and our training, you have those that are have the master's. Did you supervise anybody else? Or is that it? That would cover everybody. Uh, what type of uh, work or what type of services were provided by uh, this place where you were working? The Behavioral Health Agency? Right. Mm -hmm. They provided a broad array of services. Um, the age range was quite wide. We provided services as young as two. And I think our oldest patient was 99, somewhere around there. We provided therapy and evaluation. So during this time, it appears that you had a supervisory role, but at that time, did you also have a role in, for example, any of the treatment that was going on with the patients there? Yes. 
and specifically tell me what type of, how it was that you were involved in the treatment aspect of your job. Well, my primary role was a director there, but in addition to that, I did see my own patients. In terms of therapy, I had a handful of individual therapy patients that I would see on a regular basis, and I also um, conducted forensic evaluations in addition to being the primary lead on all of the evaluations that were done by any of the doctoral level students. And what kind of issues were presented there? In other words, what did, would you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? In terms of the evaluations? Yes. The type of questions that were posed primarily was what was the diagnostic picture of this individual? A lot of times the evaluations that we conducted were coming from children who had been in the system for quite a while and had sometimes, unfortunately, six, seven different diagnoses. And they would send them to us to help determine what is going on with them, what is their actual diagnosis, so as to help with treatment. And um, as part of working there, did you also have any occasion to have any contracts with any superior courts for evaluations? I did conduct evaluations during that time. And which, which county? Was it this county or another county? This county um, and Pinal County. We've been talking about treatment and we've been talking about evaluation. Uh, starting with evaluation, tell me what an evaluation is and what the purpose is of an evaluation and so that I, we can then compare it to treatment. What is an evaluation? in a forensic setting. A psychological evaluation is a comprehensive assessment to deter determine whatever it is the referral question is, which again is usually what is the person's diagnostic picture. So you're looking to determine a, a person's diagnostic picture at the time that you're conducting the evaluation, right? If that's the referral question, yes. And how is that different than treatment? It seems to me that you're gonna be talking to both of them at the same time, right? You do talk to both of them, but they're very separate roles. Well, how is treatment different than the evaluation for forensic purposes? An important part of therapy, treatment, is that you develop a relationship with the person. Um, you develop a closeness with them. Uh, whereas in an evaluation, you're an independent evaluator, so is that you're not biased. If, for example, I was um, to be asked to provide an evaluation, an independent evaluation on any of my therapy clients that I see right now, I, I would not be able to do that. I have a relationship with them already. So what, is there an ethical issue involving a situation where you're both a treating psychologist as well as someone who's evaluating that individual? Absolutely, especially if you're called in as an expert witness. So when you do this evaluation, do you go in, for example, and say to yourself, well, this is the person I've been contacted, and so I think that this person has, let's just pick something out of the air as a diagnosis, PTSD. So assuming that's what you think, do you then go about, as part of that evaluation, looking for items that confirm that diagnosis of PTSD, if that is your hypothesis? No, it w it's not a good idea to go in with a hypothesis, because if you do that, then you're leaving out all the other possibilities. And that's our job as clinical psychologists to be able to see, identify a broad array of symptoms so as to take that into consideration. So what's the approach that, that, that is supposed to be taken with regard to an evaluation? Well, typically an evaluation, forensic evaluation, we receive records first. It's not always the comprehensive amount of records that we end up receiving, but we get some records first. And what is it that you do with the records? What happens? So you get records, and what happens? Read the records, review them, and certainly from those records, there can be indicators in there that there are certain diagnoses that may be present versus others. As part of those records that uh, you get, um, when you read these records, um, I heard what your education was, but as part of that education, um, what, as a psychologist, does a psychologist have a special power, if you will, to go behind, for example, the words that are written down and say, well, if a person says up, they really mean down. Is, is that something that you are taught uh, when you attend school? No, if I understand your question correctly, what we do is we use those records as objective data. You take it at face value for what it says, and, you, and then you integrate it down the road into something meaningful. When you say you take those records as objective data, data, what, what, what are you saying about the records that you are calling objective data? 
What I mean by that is if I look at it and then I give it to somebody else, that they'll read and see the exact same thing. It's objective. So for example, if it has the word to, T-O-O, -O, um, are you saying then that you, you, somebody else could then, who can read, can then take that same document, for example, and read the word T-O-O-O, -O -O, T -O -O, correct? Is that yes. what you're saying? Correct. So for example, if you take a look at one exhibit here, it's uh, four, 56. Have you read this before? Yes. We have here something that says, I haven't written because there has been nothing noteworthy to report. A psychologist, do they have the, I don't know, ability to somehow look at that and say, for example, I haven't written, it says, I haven't written because there has been nothing noteworthy to report, do you have the ability to say, I haven't written because there has been something noteworthy, noteworthy to report? Is that the kind of thing that you do when you read reports in anticipation of this evaluation? I read it for face value. I read it for what it says. So objectively, what does that first sentence say? I haven't written because there has been nothing noteworthy to report. Do you go behind the words and say, well, this person said that there hasn't been anything noteworthy to report, so I'm going to go behind the, the word and say, yes, there has been something noteworthy to report, just because I'm a psychologist. No, that's just one piece of objective data that would be later integrated. So, but do you have the ability to go back and say, you know, I'm going to change this word here, nothing, to something else, just because you're a psychologist? No. Is there any thing in the schooling of a psychologist that allows you to take a look at an objective word or a word that's printed out, is there a course or is there anything out there that allows a psychologist to say, well, they wrote that, but the word nothing doesn't mean nothing. Is there anything out there that allows you to do that? No. How about the people that have worked for you, uh, somebody who has a master's and is a psychotherapist? and they've been working, let's say, for 30, 35 years, do they, to your knowledge, do they have this special ability to go behind whatever is written down and say, we're going to disregard it and just trust me as the psychotherapist when it says something else than, than what is printed there? Objection, lack of speculation and lack of knowledge. Or speculation and lack of knowledge to comment on 34 years of experience. Sustained. Anything that you know that would allow, when you train these people and you supervise, a psychotherapist with a master's to go behind the words? No, and I'm very familiar with the curriculum. And so, for example, in this case, there was this talk about the, uh, the um, law of attraction. How familiar are you with that? I've heard of it. And is this some sort of doctrine that uh, Michigan State had a course in? No. How about, uh, I think you said you went to school in Massachusetts, correct? Correct. Perhaps back in the East Coast, did they have some sort of course out there that, that, that taught the law of attraction as part of a psychology degree? No. Is that a psychology type of um, concept, this law of attraction? Not in the way that it's used in, I believe it's called the secret. So with regard to the secret, what is the secret? Knowledge, he just heard of it. Overall, can we answer the question? My, my knowledge of it is limited. Um, it's to say. Overall. It's the idea of putting out positivity. And the secret, is that a movie or what is it? Do you know if it's a movie or it's just the concept that you know I about? believe it is a movie. Is the secret required reading, uh, or is it the secret part of the training that you received while you were conducting your one year at the Arizona State Hospital? Is that something that you even came across as part of uh, your psychology training before you were actually licensed? I came across it in terms of patients bringing it up and it causing problems in treatment. When you say it was causing problems in treatment, specifically, what are you talking about? 
Well, when I'm in a therapeutic role, my goal is to teach my patients to, or work with them, on how to become balanced and how to view the world in a balanced way because there are negative things that happen in life and there's also positive things. And so the secret encourages people to only focus on the positive aspects of life, which unfortunately just causes disappointment quite a bit. So as part of your, you've told us that as part of a uh, forensic evaluation, you do read some materials. You've told us that, correct? Correct. Did you do that in this case? Yes. And then after you read these materials, you're familiar with uh, at least what the individual has written, correct? Based on whatever was provided me right. at that time. And in this case, there were materials provided to you in conjunction with somebody by the name of Jody Arias, correct? That's correct. Is she in the court today? Yes. Tell me where she is seated and what she is wearing. She's sitting right over here with a, a beige shirt. If you could just point her out for me, please. Mr. Arias. Judge, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes. So, as part of this evaluation process, you've now read what this individual has written. What is the next step that is taken with regard to a forensic evaluation? I then schedule to go see the individual. And is there, for example, a mandate, for example, that you are to see this individual, uh, I don't know, over 40 hours. Is there such a requirement, for example, that you see somebody that many hours? No. And in fact, do you consider 40 hours to be average, below average, or above, or above that? It's extreme. Extreme. When you say it's extreme, what does that mean? I've never heard of someone spending so much time. Are you speaking about a full evaluation? Somebody or? sitting and talking to the defendant for 44 hours as part of a clinical interview. As just a clinical interview, Correct. that makes it even more extreme. Why is that? Well, in, in clinical practice, just generally in evaluations, first of all, we're not afforded the opportunity to spend that much time. Typical clinical interviews, if we're talking about just regular evaluations, range anywhere from an hour to maybe three or four hours. In forensic evaluations, it certainly is more time because usually we do have access to more records. Um, they tend to be a little bit more complicated, so um, clinical interviewing certainly can last longer. And so with the 44 hours, is there a danger associated with spending that much time with an individual talking? The first thing that I think of when someone spends 44 hours with another individual in a clinical setting is that it becomes therapeutic or comes to mind maybe some of my students who weren't very good at clinical interviews yet and they really didn't know what to look for and so they ended up taking much more time doing it. And you did conduct an, a clinical interview with the defendant, correct? Yes. So when you walked into this clinical interview and you sat down to talk to her, when did you apologize to her? I didn't apologize to her. Why not? Why wouldn't you apologize? You read her journals, didn't you? I did. So as part of a forensic interview, do you see anything problematic with apologizing to the person that you are going to interview? Objection, speculation, and knowledge. Oh, no. I don't see the need to apologize to anybody. That seems odd. Why does it seem odd to come in and apologize to somebody? Apologize for what? For whatever it is that, that you had to speak to them. Is that something that you would do? Objection, speculation. Oh, yeah. It would, it would certainly give the impression that that person has, feels bad for them or has a relationship outside of that independent evaluator. It's, it's odd. I, I don't know of people who go in and apologize. It doesn't make sense to me. If an individual if you, for example, were to go in and apologize, and you said that you feel bad, if you felt bad walking into the interview, would, do you think that that's a problem in terms of your objective conduct of this interview? Yes, and I think that's primarily why, or one of the reasons why some psychologists choose to not be evaluators, because they have a difficult time taking an objective approach and not feeling compassion towards a person, being able to go in there and be an objective evaluator. So with regard to this issue of compassion, is that something, again, being compassionate during these forensic evaluations, is that something that is taught, for example, at Michigan State University? Is there a course that says when you go in, you need to be compassionate with these people that you are evaluating forensically? 
no, you shouldn't feel that compassion. You should go in there as an independent. And again, why wouldn't you feel this compassion toward this individual? It would just you... bias your results. Pardon? It would bias your results and make you sway more in finding things that might be more helpful for them. If you feel bad for them, you want to help them. And is, is that problematic if you are just there to evaluate them and provide an opinion involving a diagnosis? Yes, because the results are not going to be accurate. Well, as part of your evaluation uh, with the defendant, how many hours did you devote to the clinical interview in this case? The clinical interview was roughly 12 hours, which is a lot, which is high for a clinical and interview. Did that clinical interview that you're talking about, did that include the administration of any forensic tests? Not in those 12 hours. I did additional testing on top of that. So, for example, for the 12 hours that you spoke with her, um, with the defendant, there was not any, the testing was separate and apart from those 12 hours, right? That's correct. And once you were done with those 12 hours and the testing was done, did you then have occasion to, let's say, 10 months later, go back to see the defendant? I did not. Well, why wouldn't you go back to see the defendant? After you, you are done with your evaluation. Objection, Judge Improper. May continue. Then, after you conducted this forensic interview and you were done with the forensic interview, is there any need, after you're done with an interview as a forensic examiner and conducting an evaluation, is there a need to go back and then speak with the person that you have just evaluated? If I was uncertain about my, if I had received new data that suggested um, something different than what I had already concluded after I had conducted my testing and clinical interviewing, then I would potentially go back. But aside from that, is there a need to go back if those, there's no new data or, or you were uncertain about your opinion? And if you were certain about your opinion? Not for any ethical reasons that I can think of. And so with regard to this evaluation, um, and when you're conducting this evaluation, do you ever bring gifts to the person that, or do you ever provide gifts to the person that you are evaluating? No, that's inappropriate. 
why is it inappropriate to provide a gift to somebody you are evaluating? That's creating what's called a multiple relationship. It's what we talked about a little bit earlier about the difference between what is a therapist and what is an evaluator. As an evaluator, you want to be an independent person that's not influencing the individual in any kind of way. In this case, one of the things that uh, we've, we've heard, and have you been provided with uh, Richard Samuels' notes in this case? Yes. And after having been provided with those notes, uh, it indicates that he made a gift of a book called The Erroneous Zones to the defendant. Are you to the wording, there was never a gift mentioned. That's the statement in response. Sustained. With regard to this book, it was provided by Mr. Samuels to the defendant, The Erroneous Zones. Are you familiar with the book, The Erroneous Zones? I'm not familiar with that. So, if you are evaluating somebody, do you, have you ever, in your experience, ever provided, for example, a book to somebody? No. And have you ever provided a book that may be a self-help book as part of this evaluation? No, aside from it being a, creating a multiple relationship, I would be concerned about how that book might influence their response to any of my testing or how they responded to the clinical interview. And what do you mean how they would respond? Exactly what are you talking about? They may learn new information in there that uh, they could use to then give the false pretense that they have whatever it says in the book or it could teach them something that they didn't know before. The whole point of an evaluation is to evaluate the person for who they are. And when you say that as part of this evaluation you spent how many hours in the clinical interview, the speaking portion? Roughly 12. And what was the purpose, what is the purpose of the clinical interview as for example in this case? The clinical interview um, affords me the opportunity to learn about Ms. Arias. It gave me the opportunity to ask her about, for example, her medical history, her social history, her ability to connect with other people, her educational history, also the, her psychological history, uh, what her symptoms looked like when she was a child versus adult. I covered a broad array of areas that are typically covered in a clinical interview. And did you also cover, for example, in this particular case, what her sexual experiences may have been? Yes. And did you also cover other areas of her relationship with Mr. Alexander? Yes. As part of this uh, interview. Um, then you also said that you conducted some testing, correct? Correct. What's the purpose of conducting testing? Kind of like I described earlier, when we have um, written communication or records, it's just another piece of data. The good thing about testing is that it provides another objective viewpoint. And the people that work for you, those that had the masters and that were the psychotherapists in the state of Arizona, can they um, uh, provide or, at, or give tests to an individual that they are? working with? It's a very restricted um, amount of testing that they can do. Essentially what they can do is what's called being a psychometrist, which means that they're able to administer tests, but they are not able to, unless they're under the supervision of a psychologist, they're not able to interpret it. And in this case, uh, one of the uh, reports, did you have a report from uh, Richard Samuels? Yes. Is that the only report that you had? No. What other report did you have? I also sec question,
Thank you. With regard to this issue involving Cheryl Carr, did you receive some documentation or a report from her? I did receive a report. And did you also receive some notes and test data from her? That's correct. And this, these results and these, this report and this test data, did it contain a diagnosis, yes or no? Yes. And this diagnosis that she had, is this something that you considered in reaching whatever opinion you have in this case that we haven't talked about yet? Yes. With regard to Cheryl Carr, is she a psychologist or a psychiatrist? She's a psychologist. Is she somebody that also, from reading the report and the notes and the raw data, did she also administer tests? Yes. Did she also have a clinical interview? Yes. And as part of, well, her diagnosis was also that the, was that of PTSD, correct? That is correct. But the triggering event of that PTSD, what was the triggering event that Cheryl Karp indicated that the defendant, that she and the defendant had talked about that formed the basis of her opinion that this was PTSD? Dr. Karp indicated that the reason why Ms. Arias developed PTSD was a result of her alleged abusive relationship. You were able to look at the abusive or, or the details of the abuse that were laid out by um, Cheryl Karp, correct? Correct. And that abuse that is detailed in Ms. Karp's report, did you compare it to the abuse that was given to you or related to you by the defendant? Yes. And were they the same or were they different? They were very different. In terms of the abuse that was related to or that the defendant provided to Cheryl Karp, when you say it was very different, was it more or was it less abuse that was reported by the defendant? She reported to Dr. Karp significantly more abuse than, I, than she reported to me or to anybody else that I had the opportunity to review the records. So did she pro provide or indicate more abuse to uh, Dr. Karp than she did to Dr. Samuels? That's correct. Did she provide or indicate more abuse uh, to Dr. Karp than she did to Ms. LaViolette? That's correct. Did she provide more indications of abuse than she did to you? Yes. How many incidents of abuse did she indicate to you or physical abuse that there were? She told me that there were four distinct episodes of alleged abuse. How many events did she indicate to Mr. Samuels of abuse? It's my understanding there was four. How about to Alice LaViolette? How many incidents did she report to her? Physical abuse, is that what yes, you're referring to? Yes, physical abuse, correct. Four. But in terms of Cheryl Carp, how many events did she indicate to Ms. Carp in terms of this physical abuse? I can't even count. There, there was numerous reports of frequent abuse and threatening behavior. But there was also some events of physical abuse. Were they more or less than she reported to you? She reported significantly more to Dr. Karp than she did to me. And with regard to the report to uh, Dr. Karp, was that in the form of a document or was it, in, or was it during, the, um, during the clinical interview that she provided to her? It was part of testing. So this test where she reported this elevated or significant uh, physical abuse, what's, what is that test called? I believe it's called the partner abuse scale. I'd have to review my records to be certain. So, and as a result of the partner abuse scale, and as a result of this reporting, in your opinion, did you see what opinion Dr. Karp um, reached with regard to the defendant? What was her opinion as to whether or not this was PTSD? She concluded that Ms. Arias had PTSD as a result of the alleged abuse. And did she cite one single event that uh, 
if you will, triggered this PTSD, or did she indicate something else? No, she did not specifically indicate one. You now have that, and you now have that Cheryl Karp also um, gave some tests, correct? Yes. With regard to this testing, did you do any testing? I did do testing. Um, and the testing that you did, did any of it relate to what Cheryl Karp had done? Yes. Okay, which test did you give in response to what Cheryl Karp had given? I administered what's called the trauma symptom inventory. I did that because Dr. Karp had already administered that to her, and I was looking for consistency over time. And what's a TSI is the acronym, correct? Yes, that's correct. What is a trauma symptom inventory? What is what is that measure? What are, what are we looking at? Essentially, it's a self-report measure, which means that Ms. Arias was filling out a questionnaire. There's 100 questions. Um, it's a measure of general emotional distress as a result of being exposed to some sort of trauma. Uh, the important part of this test is that it doesn't identify what the trauma is. It simply asks questions like, do you have nightmares? Or do you have intrusive thoughts? These are all indications of exposure to a trauma. And this test, did you administer it <coughs> one occasion or two occasions? I administered it twice. And what you've told us that Mostly, you know, if you have a test, you get a result. What is the reason that you actually administered it on two occasions to the defendant? I administered it back to back. I didn't come back and give it to her a different time. The reason why I did that was because on the TSI, it indicates that the person's to reflect back on the last six months of their life. Well, the killing occurred several years prior, and the alleged abuse occurred several years prior. So I wanted to make sure to follow the protocol that Dr. Karp did, which was to have her fill out the questionnaire as it pertains to the last six months of her life, again, while she was in jail. I also wanted her to reflect back to what it was like when she was in her relationship with Mr. Alexander. And with regard to the TSI results of the last six months while she had been in jail, what is it that you found? I found relatively consistent results with, within my two times that I administered it and with Dr. Karp. There were some slight differences, but and generally similar. Specifically, what were the findings with regard to the one that talks about the six months uh, prior to the administration of the test? May I reference my test results? Sure, but let me have it so I can mark it. Take a look at Exhibit 620, and uh, I will ask you some questions, then ask you to review it, and then we will proceed. Have you reviewed it? Yes. Now, with regard to that particular test, in the previous month, six months before the test was administered while she was in jail, and uh, let me go ahead and have it, that is up the, the exhibit. What did you find? She was experiencing a number of symptoms related to depression, anxiety, um, a variety of symptoms. And is that anything unusual given the fact that she was in jail? No. Knowledge no. Now, with regard to the, the administration of the tests involving Mr. Alexander and her relationship to Mr. Alexander, what time period did you reference or indicate to her that the questions applied? I wanted to be expansive, so what I did is I had her think back to January of 2007. The reason why I chose that date is because she indicated that he started to, albeit jokingly, but making comments to her that she um, didn't like. And take a look at Exhibit 620 and see if that refreshes your recollection as to what your results were. So what were the results of 
the TSI for that January 2007 period. Again, very similar results. The most notable difference was that during that time, she was having sexual concerns, uneasiness about her sexual behavior. And uh, so when you say they were about the same, is she having anxiety? Is that what was going on or what? Yes, anxiety, depression, um, indication of um, nightmares, intrusive thoughts. Um, it appears that, I guess, for lack of a better term, the profiles were the same both in January of 2007 and when she was in jail and you administered the test. Actually, overall. Relatively the same. There were some differences. The, this uh, testing that you conducted, did you, did you also conduct further testing? Did you conduct further testing other than this TSI, this trauma symptom inventory? Yes. Um, did you review um, Mr. Samuel's report to see whether or not he had administered something called a PDS? Yes. All right, Ms. DeMarte. With regard to Dr. Samuel's... With regard to uh, Dr. Samuel's report, did he administer a PDS? Correct. What does PDS stand for? Post-traumatic stress diagnostic scale. And what is this test looking to do? The test administ is administered to determine whether there's a presence of post-traumatic stress disorder. And were you able to look? Well, what, what is it that... Uh, Dr. Samuels provided to you in terms of the raw data? Essentially a bubble sheet. And when you say essentially a bubble sheet, what are we talking about? It's raw data from the PDS. The and what is, what is a bubble sheet? Explain to me, uh, we all have seen bubble sheets, but how is this, to your understanding, how is this bubble sheet created? Well, typically the um, answer sheet is given to the person that's being evaluated and they fill it out themselves as they're reading the questions that are on the questionnaire. For example, when you've administered these tests to other people, um, do you provide them with the uh, test approved sheet in which to mark the bubbles if it is a bubble type test? Do you do that? Do I give it to them? In yes. other words, you, you administered the MCM, the MMPI, correct? That's correct. Is that also a bubble type of test? Yes. With regard to this bubble type test, did you, when you administer it, do you actually write the, the responses down on a legal pad and then transfer them for the person that you're testing onto the bubble sheet? Or do you just give them the bubble sheet to fill it out? No, the, the answer sheet is given to them, and they fill it out themselves. Why not just do it on a legal pad as you sit there and, and ask them the questions? Why don't you do it that way? That's not the protocol of giving the tests. Is there a danger if you are filling out, for example, the answers and then transferring them over to the bubble sheet? Sure, there's human error that's involved. And is that a, the protocol that's followed in administering these type of tests? No. So you were provided with the bubble sheet, correct? With regard to the PDS, right? That's correct. And what was your understanding as to who filled out the bubble sheet when it was given to you? I was under the impression Ms. Arias did. Um, and again, if Ms. Arias hadn't filled it out, would that, in your opinion, just your opinion, would that be a problem with the protocol in administering the PDS test or any test? Yes, if there wasn't an extreme reason as to why that had to occur. As you sit here today, can, can you think of an extreme reason why the person who is having the test administered is not filling out the bubble sheet? No. So you were provided, though, with the bubble sheet, right? Yes. But in and of itself, the bubble sheet, does it tell you anything independent of looking at other sources? By just looking at these bubbles filled out, does it tell you anything? No, it wasn't scored. It was just the raw data. And did you have to look at somewhere else to look at the questions? Yes. And is that something else that, as a psychologist, um, you have to go out and get, correct? That's correct. Did, was that provided by Dr. Samuels or not? 
No, it was not. So did you go out and get or obtain a copy of the um, test itself so that you could compare it then to what was on the bubble sheet? Yes, I did. And when you did that, what is it that you found with regard to the question that talks about the triggering uh, mechanism for PTSD? I found that she indicated that it was an event that occurred with a stranger. And if in this case it's been determined that the event that we're talking about did not involve a stranger, it actually involved Mr. Alexander, if that were the case, what would that do to the validity of all of the answers that followed? It would invalidate it. Can I explain why? Sure. PTSD is one of those disorders, one of the only disorders that we have as psychologists that we can directly link back the etiology, meaning where did this come from? It's a specific trauma. And the PDS actually does a good job because it asks for the exact trauma to be identified up front. And the symptoms that are then filled out are associated with that trauma. So for example, I have nightmares about that trauma. I have intrusive thoughts about that specific trauma. Again, there's a direct link. So in this situation, if the, the original item was, you said it was related to, was found what? Well, let's say you, you, the answer that you looked at involved what? What was the trigger event on the PDS that you had? That it was by an individual that was a stranger. What if it turned out that that was an absolute untruth? That it wasn't a stranger, it was somebody that she actually knew. You indicated that that would invalidate the rest of the test, right? It would absolutely invalidate the test. Well. What about the position that, that, for example, that says, well, she still suffered trauma. It's just that she, maybe it was a white lie that she told about what the triggering event was. If it was just a white lie and all of this other stuff here refers to the white lie, does that some, somehow validate this test? It does not, again, because PTSD is strongly tied to what the actual trauma is. So in terms of this PDS, if the trauma was not related to a stranger, in terms of the opinion in this case, is it worth anything? No, other than it's an other evidence that Ms. Arias decided to lie on a test. Objection, Judge. May we approach? May
Ladies and gentlemen, I, gentlemen, I'm sustaining the objection to the last question. You are to disregard the last answer. Dr. DeMarti, please listen carefully to the question being asked and answer only the question being asked. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Mr. Marti, with regard to the chain uh, story, do you know whether or not, or is it your understanding that the event that was cited as the triggering event for this PDS has subsequently changed in terms of what the defendant is saying? I'm aware of that. And because there's been this change to this other event where the defendant indicated that it was Mr. Alexander and her killing him that caused this trauma, do you have an opinion as to whether or not this PDS is valid as a confirmatory test for PTSD? It is not valid. And why not? Why isn't it valid? Especially in light of the fact that they're both trauma. The questions on the test specifically go back and ask the person to reference the specific trauma that they identified on the test. She identified a different trauma, and so all of her questions, again, such as, I have intrusive memories, were related to that event. And in scoring this test, um, have you seen the uh, scoring sheets in this case? No. Let's take, so they were not provided to you by Dr. Sandy? That's correct. Exhibit number 550. Do you see there the number of symptoms and doors to 17? Yes. Once this Test, and then we'll take a look at exhibit number 535. And then you see the number of symptoms endorsed. Do you see that? Yes. Obviously, those are two different results, correct? Correct. Um, in your practice, once something has been scored, something such as this has been scored, is there a reason, and you've reached your hypothesis, and this confirms it. Is there a reason to keep going back and rescoring something? Is, is that something that uh, Michigan State, in, as part of their doctoral um, education, is that something that they teach that once you have a hypothesis, it's confirmed, that you keep going back and scoring it not once, not twice, but three times? No. Why would you, can you see any circumstance or any necessity to score something three times. The only reason why I could see that someone would rescore it is if it wasn't scored properly the first time or if they were trying to manipulate the data. I can't think of another reason why. One of the other tests that was administered by uh, Dr. Samuels was the MCMI. Are you familiar with that? Yes. I'm going to show you exhibit number 541. Was this provided to you by Dr. Samuels? Yes. And if we take a look down here at the bottom, it does talk about PTSD. Do you see that? Yes. And then it talks about a 10 and then a 69 and a 69. First of all, with regard to this 69, if we go up to the top, it talks about an unadjusted base rate score. What does that mean? Statistically, they just adjust it. So we usually go off of the final base rate score. So um, does that mean anything, or do we really need to, if not ignore it, look to the final? Look at the final base rate score. And in this case, what was the final score? <clears throat> For PTSD, it was 69. And then if we go to the next page, it talks about base 
rate scores. What are base rate scores? Just symptom presentation, symptom endorsement. So, but what's the importance, for example, of having a 60, a 75, 85? What does that mean? Well, on any psychological test, there has to be some sort of threshold that has been designated through research that essentially tells us as psychologists, if it's past this threshold, it's meaningful. If it's not past that threshold, it's not clinically relevant. So for example, let's say that we were talking about PTSD, and we have a score that's between 60 and 75. Could I or you, as a psychologist, say, well, you know what? Yeah, that's what we have in this score. But because I've been practicing for 35 years, I'm going to ignore that. And because of my experience, I'm going to look at the number between 60 and 75 and say that that's indicative of PTSD. Is that the way it works? No. Why not? Well, again, there has, there's a threshold that's set forth by research. And you follow the threshold. It's identified in the manual. Uh, you certainly don't pretend like um, the score isn't there if it's below, below 75, but it's not telling us that it's clinically significant, which after 75, it becomes clinically significant. And by clinical, clinically significant, that means that that's an indication, correct? Yes. In and of itself, does that mean that if the person has an elevated score between 75 and 85 uh, under the PTSD marker that they automatically have PTSD? No, that's just one data point that's then incorporated with all the rest of the um, aspects of the evaluation. And this, this is called the Millen or Milan also? Milan. And with regard to this Milan test, if it's been scored once, is there any reason once you, and those, the scoring, if it's done by a computer, let's assume it's done by a computer, is there, and that doesn't have human error, like the, P, the PDS, you can tell, can you tell us whether or not it was scored? This is exhibit number 550. Can you tell us whether or not it was scored manually or whether it was scored by a computer? I would make the assumption that it's manual because it's handwritten. And with regard to this, the MCMI, by looking at this, can you tell us whether or not this was done by a computer or manually? Looks like a typical computer printout. If, for example, if this is done by a computer, do you see a need to go back and rescore this thing? No. Is there any reason to suspect or any reason that you can think of to go ahead and rescore this thing uh, once a computer has done it the first time? Only for the reasons that I highlighted before. And what are those reasons? That there was some sort of error that was made or that the data was being manipulated. And if we take a look at Exhibit 535. Question, does 